Uh, we're a mixed group today of some old Pianimals veterans and some new guests who are here for the first time. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about about Pianimals and uh, why I created Pianimals and what distinguishes it from the 150 other piano methods that are out there. And uh, a little bit of background about Feldenkrais and piano and and then we'll do an awareness through piano movement lesson, which is basically a, a Feldenkrais awareness through movement lesson, but done either at the piano or with movements specifically related to piano playing. Uh, so up there, you can't see it, but uh, there's four big books up on my upper shelf that I've, I've written with oh, about piano technique and Feldenkrais. And, uh, over 250 awareness through piano movement lessons all told and and uh it's way too many <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna wade through all that stuff <laughs> actually some people do some people do i did when i wrote it but but so each book uh, goes into a, quite a lot of detail about one aspect of piano playing the first the craft of piano playing sets the hand up and, and and shows how this grasping action creates a hand arch and how that arch is is totally necessary to walk well and to run well and to st stand well on key and to, and if we just fall in and compress the arch then we're actually creating tension which we then have to let go of but why create the tension in the first place why not just stand up of course feeling the weight of the arm but dealing with that weight well, is it a dead weight or a living weight? So The Craft of Piano Playing was my first book to kind of explore this whole idea of seeing the hand from a structural, functional point of view. The structure is the way the bones are aligned, and the function is how they move and how we conspire to move them to do all sorts of different stuff at the piano. So... Uh, People liked the book, they worked with the book, and they would come to me and they would do this totally strong... <laughs> like they would slam that structure in. I said, wow, you see how good my structure is, yeah! <laughs> it was like, so I realized, okay, we need another book. And um, uh, actually, so the second book takes that structure and emphasizes that if a human being stands up, they don't stand up to be like a statue, like, eh, hold out, I'm holding myself up. No, the human being is, is the elegant design of verticality on only two legs, almost as elegant as verticality on one leg, where you're balanced, you're not rigid. If you're, if you're rigid, you will fall over. But if you're balanced in a state of unstable equilibrium, Stable equilibrium doesn't need to worry about falling over. Unstable equilibrium does need to worry about falling over. So why would we want that? If, ugh, who wants to be unstable? Because there's so much possibility for movement. There's so much more possibility for movement. If you're stuck somewhere, you've got to unstuck yourself before you can go anywhere. So I, I play my chord and I'm standing in it. Now I have to unrigidify my hand before I can go somewhere else. But if I stood up in a way that keeps me moving, then I've never lost track of, I've never lost tra track of an internal state, an internal hand state of movability based on a continuing experience of unstable equilibrium. It's like walking a tightrope almost. That's the second book, Honing the Pianistic Self-Image. Then. Well, there's this thumb. <laughs> so the finger stands up by flexing, whole finger flexion stands the finger right up. And by the way, you can do you do this yourself, you know, on the piano or on the fall board if your piano is closed. And notice the difference. If if you curl the fingers the standard way, then that creates a certain amount of tension in the forearm. Yeah. I'm I'm already holding. But if I do a whole finger flexion, the finger virtually flat, and stand up and allow, of course, the knuckle to fall, follow forward and the arm to follow forward, I'm 
balanced, I'm in a state of unstable equilibrium. Um, of course, and I developed with, with this linking Feldenkrais to piano, I developed this idea of the hand as a mini body with the ankle, knee, hip joint, pelvis, L5, S1, torso, and the elbow functioning as a head. But of course, the, the, we don't play piano like that. That would be a real mini body. So with the forearm horizontal, the upper arm, the biceps has to bring itself into play to, to imitate the state of the arm when it's balanced on a finger in unstable equilibrium. So this standing up, I, the first two books largely to do with the standing up, but we noticed already in the first two books, each of which had a section on the thumb, that the thumb stands up totally different. And actually in, in Pianimals, I took, it, I took it one step further because we got to the point of realizing that the thumb so there in pianos, we have this, uh, the hand is a mini body, but you'll see the two hands are not the same. So that diagram there, uh, maybe you'll have to look at it yourself in your own copy of Pianimals. Uh, it shows uh, the, the, all the joints of the finger and how, they, uh, how they're related to a part of the body, like the ankle, knee, hip joint, etc. But the thumb, it's like miss, the pelvis is missing. So when I stand up on the, on the thumb, it's as if I stood up like this, but, but the one hip joint is way higher than the other hip joint. It's like wonky. So, so you know, and you know, ages and ages of pianists and piano teachers, uh, do you put the thumb under in scales? Do you not put the thumb under in scales? Do you rotate in scales? Do you shift the arm in scales? All this stuff, if there wasn't that thumb, we wouldn't have this complication, but we do have that complication. So my third book, All Thumbs, Well Coordinated Piano Technique, deals with all that. The fourth book, again, takes this idea of the hand as a mini body and says, well, what, what baby stood up at age one day and walked? No, babies have a year-long pre-standing apprenticeship where they're lying down and they're rolling around and they're doing all sorts of stuff. And But do it, if you try this while you're watching me, then very slowly, of course, then you start feeling the bones folding and unfolding without any exer uh, exertion of the muscles that would normally fold and unfold them, the flexors and extensors. And so the baby is getting to know itself kinesthetically. The mother strokes the baby. The baby's sense of self comes from physical experience of self, sensation of self, external and internal. And it develops all sorts of movements slowly without any need to do something complicated by st like standing up. But it learns to, to press, to, to actually move things to exert force through the skeletal frame. It's an incredibly complex and long-standing process. It takes a year. There are literally thousands of movements that need to be learned before the baby stands. And us pianists, oh, we stand up the first day and then we wonder why there's tension and everything there. So play the piano with the whole self, the, my fourth book, lies the hand back down and does a lot of these weird Phil Cohen-esque exercise, Phil Cohen being my, my teacher in Montreal who devised a lot of these things, um, so that there's this inner sensory enrichment of the hand which makes it stand up and walk and run more naturally without ever thinking about it. And so these 250 awareness through piano movement lessons over these four books, I distilled down into 28 lessons in pianos. And I, I, I have all, all these wonderful illustrations. Here, I'll show you them. Large, the large. The pupils book has very little text and wonderful big illustrations and big, big, big type music. So, so it's for kids. But as it turns out, uh, all my adult students who are teachers and who are using this with their kids are benefiting it fr from it themselves immensely because somehow 
in distilling it down to 28 lessons, I didn't, I managed to do that without making it superficial. I distilled it down without dummying it down. So still for many, it's a little bit of a stretch, this whole idea of these, all these weird physical movements um, actually making you play the piano better. So this is why we're here. Uh, this is an introductory section session for an eight week look at the material in this teacher's manual. So all the exercises are in here. This, the pupils, uh, pupils book doesn't have the exercise here. Pupils book is very few words. So the teacher goes through and does all the exercises and then teaches them to the student without you know, all these words. Uh, but in going through all that, the, the teacher's hand sometimes gets transformed too. Well, how about that? Uh, I also put uh, uh, piano's pointers. Uh, this is a photographic version of, of the same, 12 of the same 28 exercises, some of the most uh, important ones, uh, with photographs just so that you get a, a sense of the shape of the hand and the action of the hand on key. So for those of you who are visually oriented, that's a, that's a real, a real hit help. So Pianimals uh, uh, works on this uh, assumption that if the, the kinesthetic experience is enriched, if the sensory image in the brain of the hand and the fingers and the palm and the wrist if all that, if you feel all this more, it will work better. So many of the exercises we do have, you know, have very little to do with playing the piano. And yet if you, and you roll your hand ar around on the key like this and you wonder, what the, why is this person showing me this stuff? And then, you, and then lo and behold, and you do it with a kid and then afterwards they stand up better. I've, I've had many students come to me and they, they play. Why would anybody play the piano like that? It's that would be like walking down the street and taking a huge kind of blah, blah, at every step. You know, if I were going to a party, maybe I'd do that. But, but uh, why do children do it? Because they, their fingers are so tiny, and the perception is that oh, that little tiny finger blah, can't push that big huge key down, and so I'm going to use my arm. So give the, your kid one of these sensory exercises where they're just rolling like this and unrolling like this, but not by curling the fingers and uncurling, but by sliding the hand, and, uh, sliding the forearm and unsliding the forearm. Or else uh, doing the monster wi wi where you do a whole finger gentle grasping action as if uh, these are the eyes of the monster and you just grasp enough that the eye just comes up a little bit above the key and then all of a sudden this 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 young pupil who just played like this without one word said about don't do your arm like that starts making a beautiful phrase where the arm is joining the nose while the fingers are making the nose so this fundamental differentiation, fingers make tones and arms join tones. If you are obsessive about that, it can take that one thing alone, that one idea alone can take you very, very far. Because most of us, because we were taught this weighted technique or we were taught to relax, most of us, we blur the two. And most of us, we will, we will put a little bit of arm juice into that note to get, give it a little more pizzazz or give it a little more weight, uh, a little more fatness, a little more tone. And we don't realize what it costs us because as soon as you add that little bit of that arm to your finger, the finger is resisting the arm. You've set up a, 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 a conflict and the, it, that conflict creates tension. And then now you've got to res, you know, resolve the tension, which is why you see all these relaxation moves. So if the finger, if the finger knew how to stand up well and stand up so quickly that you can make a fortissimo, a fortissimo with no 
use of the arm. How strange is that? I, I, I've been to, uh, I, you know, I've been thinking about this for many years and the last few years going to top flight pianists concert, like the world's top concert artists whose fingers I would die for. You know, they just, they run around the keyboard. They're pianissimos, they're pianos. It's beautiful. There's so much sonority. There's so much expression. It's amazing. And yet virtually every one of them at the top level they get to a fortissimo chord and they will invest the arm in it. So this, you know, following this, these ideas of structural function for the hand can take you very far. But perhaps more important for us, it can get you, you and your students off on the right foot. A beginning pupil uh, will, will do many of these actions naturally with, uh, if you don't teach them technique at all. <laughs> They will, the beginning pupil will move the hand like that in this kind of whole finger grasping thing. I've, I've had a, uh, one of my teachers, Mario, uh, what's his name? In Munich, you know, Mario, this Spanish guy. He, he, he on purpose, for when he, he just, di he didn't tell his pupils any, anything. He just, okay, you go and play the piano. And they would go like this and play like that. And then they would get to the thumb and <laughs> they would do the thumb like that. It was the funniest thing, and after about a month, they spontaneously started joining the thumb to the fingers, like having the thumb play the, similar to the way the fingers play. But of course, all thumb says that the, the thumb plays opposite to the fingers. The finger stands up like this, but the thumb pushes the rest of the hand up to stand. So it's very, very different. Okay. I've been, I've been talking a little too long. <laughs> uh, so I think we've got just about everybody here uh, who's going to be here today now. So I wanted to welcome you all, uh, take a moment to say a real welcome and just how happy I am to have you all here. And even Christine Olson is here from Northampton. Yeah. Uh, Christine organized the first ever Alan Fraser Piano Institute 10 whole years ago. At Smith College. Um, so here we are and we're investigating this whole idea of how can we empower our piano playing and the piano playing of our students. So uh, I, I divided uh, pianos uh, into eight sections. Uh, so after the introduction, we're going to do the intro introduction today, we're not even going to start with the eight sections, but the lying down there are, I, I have five different chapters on different ways you can move the fingers and manipulate the keys and all sorts of things you do with the hand lying down, a whole section on lying down. That's the pre-standing apprenticeship. Uh, and then we do something on the thumb because the thumb is so weird and so different from the others. The thumb uh, uh, can be seen as an ugly duckling. And when you try to make the thumb like a duck, like make the thumb behave like the fingers, everything gets screwed up. But when the thumb opposes and becomes totally different to the fingers, that's when the, the thumb comes into its own and empowers the entire hand and the entire arm. Then we do standing up. Then we get into the meat of, okay, we've been lying down, and now how do we stand up? Then we start walking, and then we start running. Section five, from running into rotating. And this complicated question, how do you rotate? How much do you rotate? When do you rotate? In which direction do you rotate? Uh, it's sort of based on the, the fact, uh, on again, the hand is a mini body. And we, we may not be aware of this as we walk down the street. The, the pelvis is doing a sideways rotation and a forward and back rotation and an up and down rotation. It's doing... A three-dimensional figure eight where now my left hip is more forward, it's more to the side, and it's more up. And now my right hip is more forward, more to the side, and more up. So we don't generally walk like this, but this is happening on a, a mini, a minuscule basis. It's different from if, and you'll see people like people who are really goal-oriented, like, oh, they walk like this, and they're really going for it and everything but their their hip, hips are stiff and the and the walking is quite dysfunctional and those are the people who end up at the chiropractor or wherever 
years down the line because they have sciatica or whatever. So we want to avoid that at the beginning by dealing with rotation and then uh, hopping and leaping. Many people leap from the from the one place to another in the keyboard by carrying the hand with the arm. Fair enough. Of course, the arm does carry the hand. But when a real stand-up action powers the way the arm gets the hand there, that's much more like how the body leaps. When you leap from one stone to another crossing a stream, a big crane doesn't come over and lift you to the next stone. No, you power it with your legs. And the powering it with your legs is what makes it so accurate. So there's a whole section on that. And finally, there's a section returning to the fingertip, where the, that one little digit, uh, that's the only point of contact with the key, mostly. Um, and Hanno, who uh, you may, I may, may I introduce you, Hanno, he's the, the music editor for Pianimals. He saved my ass, basically. And coronavirus saved our asses, too, because we had all this time all of a sudden, and this thing was being edited, and he went through pedantically like four or five times and found dozens of mistakes in the music scores every time. Like, it's really... We missed a couple, actually, but we caught hundreds. <laughs> so, uh, Hanno likes to... And he's a very fine jazz pianist and composer and teacher. And he likes to do this fingertip thing at the beginning where you... Let's curl the finger, let's curl the finger. But, of course, he has his students do it in a way that you don't curl the finger and then all of a sudden uh, there's no hand hip joint. See, if I curl the finger and the, that hip joint collapses, that's a disaster. But there's a way of curling the finger, curling the finger, and that the effort for the curl ripples back and there's your lovely, healthy hand hip joint. He likes to do it at the beginning. And I debated about whether to put that section at the beginning, but in the end I decided no, because I kind of prefer to do it developmentally and leave that the, like the icing on the cake of course uh and then section eight the whole body relating the the mini body the hand to the whole body and because this there's a huge participation of the whole self in playing so we're going to spend eight weeks uh beginning on january 22nd but which brings me to an organizational thing we are now here in my home in the western part of New Belgrade, and we're not in my studio where I was, I wanted to be, because I, I, I share my studio with my lovely landlady who's a, 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 an artist, a painter, very, very fine painter, my Maiolinica Jovanovic, and she teaches in the studio on Saturdays. Right now, Saturdays is Monday, and maybe it's gonna be Fridays and Saturdays. But anyway, uh, so, uh, we, if this continues, uh, if her schedule continues like this, then, and it may well, then I'm going to have to shift this whole Pianimals Institute onto Sundays. And I'm worried about it because, I, you know, Sunday's a family day, and I'm worried that many people won't be able to come who would otherwise come. So if even a, 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 some weekday evening would be better than a Sunday evening, I'm going to put a... I'm going to put a, 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 a whatever you call it, a, a question, what do you call it, survey. Yeah, I'm going to do a survey so that we'll come up with the best time, but it, it looks like it may not be starting on January 22nd, but rather the 23rd, the Sunday, at 6 in the evening European time. The eight weeks will go through, and each, uh, and each lesson here has a, has, has a way of moving the hand, which will be considered very, very strange, but if you do it, the reflexes gain something. Certain muscles start firing more and other muscles let go more. And then you go to play the piano and a, a different part of the brain from the thinking brain, the motor cortex has a great capacity to, to simultaneously and intuitively use the self image to create the most effective way of doing a movement. So we're kind of, we're learning a grammar, a physical grammar of spontaneity. If we can improve the way we move and also have more variety in the way we move, then we can, we can have more musical choices and we can have more variety in our color and in our expression. How many times do you hear 
somebody and it's very expressive, but then the Chopin expression is the same as the Rachmaninoff expression, which is the same as the Bach expression, which is the same as the Beethoven. It's all expressive. And much of it is expressive on the lo on the local scale. And for me, to my mind, it actually comes from structural anomaly, anom anomalies, structural functional anomalies. Which, if you go through this system, you work them out, and all of a sudden, not only on your are you on your are you, are you more on your feet physically, just in terms of you know no pain, no 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 risk of injury, and better sound, and more virtuosic better velocity but also the sense of being master of the music opens up and you start having a real sense of command over what you want to say as a pianist and i think if we can impart this to our pupils we'll have done them a tremendously precious service so that's the sort of the aim of pianimals and the aim of this this eight-week course so, today, the awareness through piano movement lesson is not going to be one of those eight sections, but we're going back to the introduction. And uh, uh, this is because if this lesson that we do today stays in your memory, not only your, my memory of, oh yeah, I did this and I can see myself doing this, but the physical memory, the actual, the sensations that you're going to evoke in your arm. If this lesson stays in that part of your physical memory, it will inform how you play and create new possibilities for phrasing and for color and for free, agile movement of the fingers. So would you please come to the piano? Uh, I'm sitting very low because that happens to be the only bench that I, that I can find today. I like sitting low. We'll talk about why another time. Uh, and uh, so chapter one of Piano Pianimals comes from, it stems from the first, the first lesson my teacher, Phil Cohen, ever taught uh, Robin Belkin, who was my sister's best friend in high school and who is now a poet who, who goes by Robin Sarah and who's written a book called Music Late and Soon. The quote being from Wordsworth, the world is too much with us late and soon. And who came back to the piano after a 35 year hiatus. And she writes a beautiful book. Let me show it to you. Yeah. I would highly, high. This is a great stocking stuffer for anybody who's looking for Christmas presents for people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful read. And she talks about the, the first lesson she ever had was Phil Cohen when she was 14 or no less than 14 yeah. anyway and she went home and told her mother about this lesson and the mother went this is completely weird and then Robin said yeah but I liked it I liked it and said, okay let's, we'll continue with this Mr. Cohen uh, so uh, let's do the, the first with the piano closed So again, if you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. If you can feel every part of yourself and feel how it's moving, you can move as you want. So let's see how much we feel our arms and our bodies. So would you please just raise your arm up the air and let, and let the hand dangle. Raise the arm up in the air and let the hand dag on them. And now move it extremely slowly down. And don't do anything. <laughs> and even when the finger touches the, 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 the fall board and it starts to crumple or whatever, just watch and feel what it does. And then all sorts of stuff is happening. And then all sorts of stuff is happening. And then finally you slip off the, and your hand is, is resting on your lap or hanging down somewhere. Try that again. And really try to figure out what's going on. Because, you know, the, the fingertip will touch first and then another fingertip and then they'll start to crumple. But is there resistance? Are you, resist are you trying to stand up, like play a note, like you would if you were playing a note? Or can you just let them crumple? And finally, the thumb touches and then you feel the wrist changing direction. And does the wrist, 
end up f laying on the fallboard and then if the arm keeps going it will does it does it kind of slide the hand slowly slowly and then there's this unfolding of the finger and each one of you will do it differently and my problem is that I'm looking at me but I should be looking at all of you <laughs> so let's see let me try and look at you guys what's happening in your neck do you feel some part of your arm letting go oh david your your uh, camera's so high that i can't see your hand i can't see the surface upon which your hand is gently descending like a leaf wafting on the wind but now it crumples yeah so most of you managed to do it okay without the the finger resisting without the finger trying to play the piano or stand up or something because because we're doing it on the fallboard we're not doing it on the on, on the keyboard so would you please you've only done it four or five times please hang your two hands by your sides and notice the difference in sensation between left and right. It's, it's amazing, like just a tiny little bit of sensory work. And, and there's already a difference in sensation. Sometimes is one arm lo feeling longer than the other? Is, is one arm warmer? Or can you feel parts of the fingers or parts of the wrist that you didn't normally pay attention to? So let's do one hand today. You can this this is being recorded, so you'll all get the recording. So you can do the other hand next time, okay? But if we just do one hand, open the open the fallboard, and now do the same thing, but on key, and see if you, how many of you, if the finger like somehow, gets the idea. Oh, now I have to play the piano, and then the finger does something, or can it just crumple as? as neutrally and as indifferently as when you did it on the fallboard. And the slower you go, the more you'll feel. And by the way, the slower you go, the more you'll tend to actually uh, notice that there are hitches in the movement, like it, it sort of goes tuk, 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 instead of just con smooth, like continuously smooth. So can you go extremely slow, extremely slow, but still have it be continuously smooth? And then the fingers start folding in a different direction from the, 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 the direction they were folding in before. And then the hand goes to a different spot on the white keys, and the palm goes to a, a different place as it's falling off the white keys and sliding down onto your lap. And then you try again, after resting, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. And some people like that, that the arch of the hand, the, the, the second, the, the metacarpal phalangeal joint, some of them are going down or up or they don't know where to go. So if you just crumple the hand, does that arch go up, down, up, down, up, down, or does it just follow a continuous path? Yeah. Christine. Oh, hello, Andrea. When did you show up? And we have Alex Schmusov, who is another newcomer. Great. So this is a, no, hang your two hands by your side and notice, is there a change in feeling between the hand that was doing this and the other one? The wrists, does the, does the wrist feel different? Does the forearm, does the elbow feel different? Does the shoulder feel different? Are you sitting differently? Did you go to a different spot on your sits bones from where you normally would? Because something has let go in that arm that was doing this weird exercise. 
So this of all this stuff I'm I'm asking you this Phil didn't bother it with he just said had her do the exercise. <laughs> and you notice that we're doing it without without playing. And so uh, the, this whole introductory section there's there are several different pieces in it although it's only one chapter. Usually I did one composition for each chapter, but here there are so many things that can go wrong with this. For instance, uh you could the the many people the finger will actually try to play the piano and and there's a stiffening like there's a structuralization of the finger so that now it's not just three loose bones curling and uncurling folding and unfolding collapsing and uncollapsing but there's some sort of structure it's like trying to stand up but this you will stand up eventually to play but if you do this and resist the the attempt the uh, that that's reflexive attempt to stand up then it will educate and inform how you eventually do stand up but now cultivate that so-called mistake and actually come to the key and and let the fingertip go to the bottom of the key and then stiffen the finger and then come back up again so actually stiffen and come back up and boom stiffen and come back up and a different finger stiffen and come back up uh, Dina could you be even more vertical like I'm being ridiculously vertical you see yeah like that like that yeah and uh, David as well yeah Maggie that's good yeah Christine I, I can only see the top of your head I admire your hairdo, but I prefer to see your hand. If... Yeah. Uh, Grace. Now, Grace is doing an interesting variation. And uh, uh, Katya Mauro is another Feldenkrais piano person, a uh, long-standing dear friend of mine and colleague. And she said that, why are you lifting your shoulder and your elbow, Alan, when you do this? And many of you are doing copying me but grace is doing it like this from the elbow yeah so from the elbow and so yeah look at grace that's it so that's a, a completely different movement but also very valuable yeah so grace if you can do that and then when you come to key stop before you go to the horizontal like just your hands dangling it's not quite, you see, why do I put my elbow up this? I never explained this to Katya clearly. When you put your elbow way up high like that, then the hand can dangle more vertically. You see? Dum, dum, dum. Yeah. No matter what finger you're doing, see, when the elbow's down here, then the hand is not quite as vertical. So, Grace, when you do it, yeah, okay, Grace, that's great. So, when you do it with the elbow high, you, the hand is fully vertical. And so it's really like a pogo stick, and we'll do the pogo stick afterwards. But when it, the elbow is down, it's slightly less vertical, but I want you to keep that pogo stick feeling. So once you've got contact, do not go to the horizontal, but just stay there and peck it like, what? yeah, like that, Grace. Thank you. So that's a good distinction which Grace has shown us. Yeah. So, of course, uh, where are we? This is... The pogo stick it's the second one the second piece the pogo stick and basically you would you would get your students to try the, this exercise and crumple 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 and if they don't crumple but they actually they try to play the note then emphasize that Feldenkrais often will go with the strategy so if somebody's doing too much of something like I'm sitting too much on my on my right sit bone Feldenkrais will have you go more on the right sit bone and then it's easier to change to something more symmetrical. So that's the, the, the idea of the pogo stick. Okay, you want to stiffen your finger? I told you not to, but you stiffened your finger. Okay, now let's really stiffen the finger. <laughs> like that. And then you make a little game of it. That's right. And then you try the same thing, uh, but going to the other way and now see if it's easier because you stiffened 
now that you can can you really 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 feel how to make a slight sound without stiffening anything anywhere in your whole system what happens when we play the pinky they do you fold the other fingers under uh good question I kind of just turned my hand a little, I'll do it this way. I, I turned it a little sideways. Like I, I just did this. <laughs> so you see now my, my pinky is vertical and the other fingers are just the inside. And for the second I did, I turned my hand to the outside so that the second is the, is the closest one. So I can do it. So I can do my, and that's actually related to the list bicycle spoke exercise. Franz Liszt made an exercise where you're, he says, imagine your fingers or five fingers are the five spokes of a bicycle wheel and you just, that's the, it's in my second book of honing the pianistic self-image, but, but here we're not going to do that, but we could angle the hand so that we can get any finger we want to be the pogo stick finger without resorting to curling the others. But if you can't do it, then sure, curl, curl the other fingers loosely. But of course, when you curl the other fingers loosely, then you're going to want to curl that finger loosely too. So <laughs> that's a very good question <laughs> because it's quite complex. Can I curl some fingers and leave the other finger totally straight? Yeah. I can actually, but it's, it's a more complex neurological phenomenon because if if i for instance if i just flex my thumb like that then the other the fingers are also coming towards the thumb it's not just the thumb coming towards the finger so there's all sorts of uh, resonance going on between different parts okay so we've done lazy lion why did i write lazy lion on the black keys i have no idea cuz this is yeah it's, I don't know, one would think that for a tiny little person's hand, like getting that finger onto a black key is more difficult than getting the finger onto a right key. So if you're, you're doing this and you find that your kids can, can play Lazy Lion much easier on the white keys, then just transpose it a half tone up or down, and, and that's e very, very easy to do now. So now we, we get variations, which are a sort of a development in, in complexity. So now we're going to dangle, 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 and do it. It's not like a pogo stick because it looks like a pogo stick, but there's no, there's no stiffening of the finger. Yeah? No stiffening of the finger. No stiffening of the finger. Yeah. And then the tightrope walker... This is the nice thing. And I'm sorry, I did it wrong. The tightrope walker is... So obviously, if the finger's totally limp, then it's a little wiggle of the arm that, that's playing those three notes, but leaving everything loose, like the fingers are as loose as a rope. So you imagine you, you've got a rope, and you put the rope on the key... And you do some wiggle so that somehow you get that rope, which has no agency of its own. It's just a dead thing. And you sort of make that rope play a repeated note. That's right. And feel what's going on in the upper arm, in the neck, in the forearm, in the elbow. Yeah. Yeah, that, David, I think you're using too much effort. I, I want to do this. And then come up, come up. Just three. Yeah, because it's amazing how many times we have to reinforce the arm is floating. The arm is floating. The arm is weightless. I My arm has weight, but it's not going to fall. It's the, the weighted arm is going to come up. And that, of course, is a preparation for Elegant Alianus, which is the first piece I ever wrote for pianimals. Ah... Uh, and there is the hand is going up and down and now we're really doing the the original phil cohen exercise because it's to sound a note without 
any of the normal musculature involved. We use a completely, so you know, we're actually sounding the note with, with the arm, but the arm is continually flowing. So actually the arm and the finger are differentiated. And we prove that they are differentiated by by being able to repeat with no... You see why I've been harping at you for so long to, to don't flex, don't stiffen. Try to get the key moving without any sense of stiffening anywhere. Because the, the whole thrust of Elegant Alliance is, is to is to be able to repeat a note without stiffening at all and without the arm segmenting its movement. The arm is breathing an out breath, an out breath, an out breath. And it's one continuous out breath, not several. If you're not sure whether you're segmenting it or not, then you put the other hand on your forearm. You're looking perplexed, David. What's your question? <laughs> Can you play multiple times with the arm in a continuous movement? Yeah, so you see, the arm didn't stop moving down. The floating flamingo halfway through the book, it does the same thing going up. If that's easier for you, like the, the arm is now breathing in. If that's easier for you, then try it that way and then go to the more difficult one, which for some perverse reason I put at the beginning of the book, which is doing that repeated thing going down with no segmentation of the arm movement. It's an out breath. So if you can't do five, then you just do two. One, two. I don't feel like I'm doing this at all with my finger. I don't feel that. I feel... It, pro it, it, no, it, it must be doing something. I think I get it. But the thing is, it, that whatever that little thing is doing is, it's so tiny that it, it feels like nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, start with a higher wrist. David, you start with a higher elbow. Do this weird elbow up in the air thing. Yeah, you're going to get it better like that. See, now you have, your arm has further to go. Like, now you can, oh, yeah, I can really feel what going down is. I just, I've just got an email from somebody who's trying to get in. Oh, okay. No, she's not. Okay, good, 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 good. Excellent. Okay, questions. <laughs> we already had it. This is too weird. What's, what this, what's this guy doing? The hand is a mini body. Most of my arguments come from people who were, were brought up with the weight technique. And, and, and so I've given up saying don't play with weight. I, I say play with weight, but I just make sure that it's a living weight, like the weight of my own body, which is not clump, clump, clump down the street, but which moves in gracious and the other thing is, is th th although this movement here seems very generic, one of the, the most frequent questions I get is like somebody's playing. Uh, oh, uh, somebody's playing a melody like that, and they and they think, oh my God, it's it's not really singing. Could I use the elegant alliance uh, technique to pl play this melody? And my answer is always. By all means, <laughs> that's exactly what it's designed for. So if you just do that, but of course I'm doing floating flamingo, which is... You can also go doing it, but it's basically the idea of the arm is moving at a different speed than the notes are moving. Uh, and but we get this this idea of a totally uh, almost a disembodied arm, a, an arm which is not connected to the finger by any stiffening, by just doing this original crumpling thing and uncrumpling thing. So I like to do this first because it's, it's kind of weird, but it sets the stage for everything it follows. If this experience that you have now, 
permeates your subsequent experiences studying pianimals, then it's, it's all to the good. I have a question. Yes, Maggie. So in real time with a six-year-old who can yeah. barely stay sitting in the chair, yeah. if I have maybe a minute, maybe three minutes, I mean, how does this work when you're in the ground with little children who, the, especially modern little kids, have kind of no interest? You know, they, they, I have been doing a little bit of this sort of thing with them, and it's very hard to get them to say something about that. Um, yeah, uh, it's a, a, a completely valid question. And and uh, generally, uh, studio teachers don't have a lot of time, so, so I... Uh, I, I offer through this book, I offer very, very short versions of these things. So now we're doing it for a long time and I took you through each of the, but you might, you might telescope this into 30 seconds with a kid. But I think, um, and there is, it's slow down, slow down, slow down. And it's, they're not interested in slowing down. They want, so, but they, every kid loves things that are weird. And every kid loves things that are gross. So you go, make you make yourself like this. And they go, uh, <laughs> did you fall over or did you uh, did you poke it? You, you know, I mean, there's always a, a way. <laughs> there's Amy. Uh, hi. There's always there's always uh, Christine has been using this stuff for a long time, Christine Olson. So she might have something to add to what I just said. Is that what you are yeah, waving yourself? It, yeah. You're you're demonstrating it. It's you put it into a story, an image, anything that you know is fun and grabs your attention. But you never say, "Oh, let's drop your arm." You say, "Oh, you know, here comes a log flying up from the sky or something." You're good at stories, so. Mm -hmm. It's all about the imagery and the story that you add. Yeah, which is and basically very brief, very brief, very brief. Mm -hmm. And and which is and these these uh, which is basically why every every chapter has its own animal. So uh, there and and you know there's a lolling elephant. So for for lying rolling the hand onto the back, there's a baby elephant and the mother is is changing her diaper, and for playing the piano like this. There's a uh, there's abominable ape, who's uh, who kind of like he he was a little too <laughs> the piano did not survive you know so every single one of these exercises has a has an animal and so you can very quickly look you point at the exercise at the illustration and they say okay do that you know or bird beaks picking. Yeah, the bird beak series, that's a whole other thing. The, the, a lot of the standing up uh, exercises are, are based on the bird beak, which is an extremely quick way. So, but a really great question, because yes, you know, who, who's going to, oh, <laughs> who's got time for that? You know? So there, there has to be a quick way. In my experience, when I, I take so much time to do it like this with you, because you're grown up and everything, then your experience is 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 really rich, like and enriched on so many levels. And then it, it's up to you to telescope it to make it shorter, but not less profound. Shorter, but not superficial. And I, I find that people are really good at doing that. But you'll be better at doing that if you didn't do the shorter version. If you did the extended version, and you've got it, because then you've got every detail of this sensory experience in your body because when you want to shorten it to it you're going to have to sacrifice certain of those details but if you have all the details in you then you'll generally sacrifice the ones that that particular kid doesn't need so much and you'll retain the particular details that oh yeah that this particular aspect could really help this kid you know? like some kids they're they're stiff as a board so they need this crumpling other people are just like totally wimpy so this kind of crumpling exercise like, they already do that all the time and it's chronic so maybe you know the stand-up exercise or the bird beak exercise so different kids in your studio may get diametrically opposed um uh you know 
treatment or or you know you because you can pick and choose of the of this from this whole set you don't have to give every kid all of them and as i write in the in the introduction it's actually christine olson asked me about this which is why i ended up making a paragraph about a structure versus sensation the second page of the introduction so as you go through there will about half of the exercises do a very strong structuralization like uh, feel that structure feel the power of those bones when they stand up when they stand up wow isn't that great and boom 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 like that and all sorts of stuff and the other half are like this sensorial kind of lolling around it, sensing every tiny detail and I tend in this I tend to linger at the two extremes and trust you to find the middle I don't do like I, I'll often I'll do the exercise I'll write some exercise and it's either a sensorial one or a structural one and then the piece of course already in the composition it's not using that exercise in a pure form, but it's already translated into music. Except in certain cases, I actually wrote for Abominable Ape, I wrote... Uh, I, oh, that's for Waltzing Wally Walrus, actually, yeah? But even then, you, it, it's playing music, you're already... So the initial exercise gives you a sensory experience, a sensory impression, and then the brain uses that illumination of this is who I am, this is my hand, this is how it works, this is how it feels, and then you're playing music. So the, the pieces try to be a, a kind of an intermediate step. The piece does use that particular exercise in a musical way. So it's, it's not quite like just going to normal repertoire. There's this intermediate integrative step. Uh, which is why this this thing works so well in conjunction with other methods or, or you know your own. I mean, you probably have your own repertoire, your own uh, uh, series of pieces you like to give your kids. So this is designed to to dovetail, in, you know, complementary to other methods, not to replace other methods. Does that answer your question, Maggie? Yeah, great. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, David. Oh, yeah, David. David's picture disappeared. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, sorry, I actually do have a question. Yes, Dina. <laughs> um, sorry to kind of backtrack, and I think you maybe answered it, but um, oh, the, please, exercise, please. the yeah. exercise we just did, there was a sort of high arm... Yeah. And then um, I think it was Grace who was doing this version. Did you say that was a different exercise? No, or? It's the same exercise. It's just a different way of doing it. Okay. And in, in the book, I make no comment. I don't say lift your elbow up high. I don't say leave the elbow out down low and just do it from the forearm. I do say lift your arm up. So in my mind, that means your whole arm. But Katya, bless her heart, she's not here today, but she, she caught me. Alan, like, how can you make all that tension in your shoulder? You're a Feldenkrais practitioner. Of course you have to do it like this. And actually, it's only today now that we were discussing it. I realized, oh, when you're like that, the hand could be more vertical. I never figured it out until now. So uh, so I, I'll have to get back to Katya. And you see, <laughs> there was a reason. I wasn't just being... A poorly organized Feldenkrais practitioner. I guess my first thought with the arm like that is, I mean, I'm, I'm very new to this just for everyone else. So this is my first kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. But thinking with, with a child doing something like that, will they then think this is how they have to play? Yeah, those yeah piano, right. right? <laughs> so. No, I would, I would actually do that. And you, you see how many of them you, them you can fool into playing like that for like months and months. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good joke? <laughs> keep paying, parents. Keep paying. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my daughter. My daughter went to a, a, a daycare in Novi Sad with all Serbian kids. 
And then there was this Australian boy showed up one day and he spoke no Serbian. And the teacher said, oh, good, Masha, you can speak, speak with Alexander. <laughs> so she comes home and she tells me this and she says, Dad, you know what I did? I didn't speak English with him once the whole day. <laughs> Wasn't that a good joke? <laughs> she, okay, now, Dad, no, darling, yeah, that was a very good joke. You know, you're supposed to join with your kids, but tomorrow you'll speak English. No, no, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. So I would, I would, be, I would love to see a, a Christmas recital with everybody playing like this. That would be so great. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and actually, you know, we always learn best when we're having fun. I mean, Feldenkrais said it repeatedly through his trainings, like, when you're laughing, you're learning way better. So, so there is, there's something to be said for that kind of joke. <laughs> yeah. um, no, 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 no. So would you now uh, please mute, mute your mics and take whatever kind of music you want to take, uh, some piece that you're playing now, and you try to play whichever hand was doing this weird, elegant alliance. Uh, the the chapter is actually titled the title sound. The title of the chapter is actually the most beautiful sound in the world. Because how I started off in the book is like have them play a note and then notice how much constriction there is in the way they play, and then. Let's go. Is the sound more beautiful when you play it with nothing constricting any? And see whether playing with a real sensory memory of these exercises, these floating arm exercises, whether it makes a difference, one, in your physical feeling, but of course much more important, in the sound of the music. Maggie, your your camera is too close. I can't see your arms. I want to see those floating flamingo arms. Thank you. So fool around with it for a couple of minutes, and then I'll take a survey. I'm very I'm really interested because I don't know if this stuff is effective or not. You know, you know. Did, did the experience of the awareness through piano movement lesson go away? Or do you actually notice a difference? What kind of a difference is it? And what are your impressions? What's, what's going on in your experience? What's that integrative step look like? Going from a pure sensory exercise to actual playing. Come see, come saw, David. <laughs> no, more pronation, like way more pronation. Oh, way more pronation. Yeah, way more just like using. This mm -hmm. is very cool. This, yeah. this, I like, this is very good. And it's so interesting. Who would have thought that that would be what happens? But the nervous system takes the information and then it's a new self-image. And then, okay, wait a minute, let's go here. Anybody else? Yes, Grace. Yeah, I have more of a sensation of riding the key up and down. Ah, this is wonderful. Yeah. You can kind of feel it being spongy. Great. Great, 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 great. And this, of course, relates directly to another one of my, my favorite provocative statements, which is that the biggest illusion in piano playing is that the key goes down. Oh, I don't, it's in here somewhere, but I can't remember which chapter. Anybody remember? And of course, 
Of course, the piano keys go down, but what Grace just said that she felt it going down and coming back up again. She was sliding on it and in it and through it, which is a fundamentally different relationship to the key from <coughs> pressing it down. So, and now all the reflexes all the way through the arm and into the body were tuned to allow her to have that experience of the key. But that's going to fundamentally change the way you play piano in general. So it's a wonderful example of we, we do a certain reflexive kind of exercise to enrich the sensation. And then we don't really even know what, what, the, what the results are going to be. Like what's, what's going to be the benefit? What's going to be the improvement? It can be something quite unexpected. But it relates in this case very much to the, the key is a lever. It's not something I press down and, by the way, if I hold it down, it's no longer a lever. And my finger is no longer a lever either. I'm holding it down, I'm con contracted, and the key is compressed, constricted. So as soon as the key loses its ability to be a lever, then the music stops. It's a dead, dead sound. And when the key continues to be a lever, it continues to be able to move. So I move the key and I'm aware that the key is, move, is moving my finger back up. The key is pushing my finger back up. Therefore, my finger never stops being a lever. So you see, uh, the th my finger is not going up and down. It's obviously a lever. It's just going sideways. This is just going back and forth. It's a lever. So the fact that the key goes up and down is not its fundamental nature. That's just... Uh, it's chance and it's it's how the the mechanism works but if we you know gravity we don't have to help gravity out by <clears throat> pressing it down more if we just treat it as a lever so this sensory exercise of floating the hand and collapsing the finger and then and then uncollapsing the finger but not with finger effort just bleh. there are many unexpected benefits and of course uh, there's a kind of an optimal way of moving where there are no parasitic contractions, uh, where no muscular effort is wasted. There's nothing, nothing goes into holding that would block movement. Everything goes into actually moving something. And these, the honing the sensory basis of our movement allows us to attain to that kind of really well-organized movement and that's when the piano starts to sing because we're not compressing it we're freeing it to the soundboard to move when we free the key to move yeah i love that grace anybody else yes maggie there's a lot more breath in my body there's a lot more breath in your body wow great yeah Again, when we, when we get into that key and stand on it, but in a compressive way, the whole, there's this kind of a, it's almost like armoring, they call it, it's like, psychologists call it armoring, right? Where the whole body will contract in resonance with that hand contraction. So now, oh, the hand is just moving, the arm is just breathing, and the ribs are, oh, oh, oh. They're, they're doing the same. Oh, I like what that hand arm thing is doing. I, I can do that too. Yeah. And the shoulders are freer. When this, you know, Katya accused me of tensing my shoulders, but actually, no, I was not tensing my shoulder. I was just allowing it to float. It's a very, very different feeling. So it's amazing how much the shoulder can rise without tensing. If you're just following, following, following the hand, following the hand, following the hand. Look at that, it went right through to my left hip joint. Zoop. Yeah. And the, the more I do this float, 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 crumple, 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 uh, slide, 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 uncrumple, uh, rest, 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 the more the whole body decides, hmm, I like that, I don't like these contractions, let's just dispense with them. <sighs> and all of a sudden we can breathe. I've been dealing with some tension in my forearms um so your 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 voice is kind of distant brian can you turn your volume up you've been dealing that with better tension? yeah it's much better okay yeah i've been dealing with a lot of um tension in my forearms especially when i'm trying to play something 
quicker. So mm -hmm. I, I was noticing that this feels very relaxed. I'll be just curious to see how that translates to, you know, as, as I pick up tempo. Okay, so here's what you do. In order to tr have this translate when you pick up tempo, you, it's, it'll be good for you if you keep a certain strategy in your mind, which is based on the following. Uh, so when I get out of the chair, the legs, they go into extension and they launch the body up, okay? So you tell me, uh, where is the initiation for standing up, for getting out of a chair? Is it in the legs? Watch carefully. Where was the initiation for standing up? Yes, Brian, you muted yourself. It, it's in the forward lean. It's in the body. It's in the torso. Yeah. So the faster you want to go at the, on the key, the more the arm is going to lead. The big mistake we make is I'm already tense because I'm moving my arm as much as I need to. But that's this generic it's journeyman. It's just like I'm using moving the arm as much as I need to, but no more. But if I wanted to shape the phrase and if I wanted to attain to the same function as getting out of a chair, then my arm is my arm is gonna initiate and the fingers and the fingers end up just they can manipulate the keys. They can manipulate the keys with virtually no effort because the arm is taking them. The arm is taking them where they need to be. Yeah. So the, the, you're feeling good because of the, what we did now, but you can do something very practical and uh, overt, like you lead with your arm more in whatever passage work you're doing. I had a guy yesterday show my fourth ballad. That left hand part, second theme, uh, second time. And I just, I, I had him actually do the teetering. So this is uh, from Pianimal's Pointers, it's variation six. And I had him stand on one finger and bunch another finger in there and then teeter. So it's basically doing this. And te but teetering ridiculously far so you see what i'm doing i'm teetering and i'm going almost lying down almost lying down way 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 farther and this guy is a new student of mine a sweet boy <laughs> he says professor you're my idol i've been reading your books since i was a little kid yeah. unbelievable some guy he lives in hanoi so we finally got him lying down like this and i told him okay now play that passage like that what? You must be insane. And finally, when he, when he did it, not only was it about virtually effortless, like literally 5% of the effort he had been investing in that, it sounded way better because it bubbles. Yeah. So that's the, uh, an extreme version of what I'm suggesting you do, Brian. But that, that, again, it's an extreme application of this initial sensory experience, which is really going to make a lot of our passage words take off. It's a little more tricky when you have to change direction. Like, uh, now there's a little change of direction, but you basically ignore it. <laughs> yeah. You, you do a little kind of a flippy thing. <laughs> you see, I did something for the change of direction, but I didn't go back. No dancer, no ballet dancer doing a choreography would just go back. They would kind of wiggle through. You understand? It's a compound movement. And so, you see, you know, I can walk, a, a guy walking down the street, all the dynamics of walking are there. The legs stand up, the body's moving smoothly while the legs move segmentedly. That's the arm joining notes, the fingers creating notes. But a choreography, a, a ball, an artistic ballet dancer goes way further. And that's why this kind of a movement... Uh, this kind of shaping the phrase, I mean... The art of shaping the phrase like that, that's 
uh, something you're going to be investigating for the rest of your lives because there's no end to it. And every time it'll be a little bit different because it's like two snowflakes. You, there's no two. They're the same. I can try and do it exactly the same. But if it's a living and not just a reproduction, then there will be a subtle responsiveness in there that allows it to be truly unique. You know, I did this to sound similar, but it wasn't the same as the last one. <laughs> Each one is new. And this is, the, this is this, I'm glad we're talking about this because this is really one of the deep underlying intentions of pianimals. This is not just to make you play a little better or you know, resolve some technical problems. So we're, we're going for a deeper, more responsive and individual kind of artistry. So, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, just angle your arm more this way, you know, stuff like that. But if we think it's just physical, that's a deceptive kind of a perception. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I made the same mistake for dozens and dozens of years. I mean, I, I was studying with Phil Cohen and I had all my notes and it was, move your wrist to the left on the F sharp and then stand the thumb up more on the E. I had reams and reams, dozens and dozens of pages of these notes. This is in the days, this is 1980s, nobody filmed their lessons. I recorded some of my lessons on audio tape. Difficult to figure out what the hell was going on. I threw all those notes away because like, it means nothing. Stand up more on the F sharp. But I, that's what I thought it was. I wanted so much to learn this stuff that I, I got stuck in this it's the physical, the physical grammar of it. But the physical grammar, it's only a reflection of what we want to do musically. And if we have a grammar of spontaneity, then we know how to move ourselves on key so that the relationship to the key is always dynamic and responsive and never imposed. That's the deeper thrust of pianos. Uh, there was another question, I think. And that's a book, the grammar of spontaneity. It's <laughs> so. it's a it's a it's a, a series of Feldenkrais lessons given by Ru Ruthie Alon. Ruthie Alon. I just got her book. Yeah. I know it. No, I know it as a series of cassette tapes. I had that too. That's what I went for. Oh, because well, there's a I'm book. In the book. Oh, yeah. Right. She has a wonderful uh, approach to um, um, awareness through movement lessons. A very she was a very Ruthie. airy and yeah, artistic Ruth, woman. Ruthie, Ruthie's lessons are pure gold. I mean, that that I mean, but you know, then I I stole. I mean, I used that her title, the grammar of spontaneity, in it's in wonderful. here, and I call it what we're doing here is we're developing a pianistic grammar of spontaneity. So it, it directly is is from Ruthie that uh, I I got this wonderful formulation, which I I think you know. There's a lot in that formulation. There's a, it's, you can delve really deeply into that and spend years discovering what the implications are and what that really means at a, at a deeper and wider level. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, we'll leave how, you. Oh. How, short, how short are your fingernails? Uh, Today, they're not particularly short, actually. I should cut them. Mine are too long, yeah. Oh, just play yeah, with flat they... fingers. Just play with flat fingers. This is the long finger now. You can play anything with flat fingers. Clamp your thumb to the fingers and boo, 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 boo. That's, uh, it's this one. There you go. That's right. It's... Sassy Seal. Sassy Seal. It's the first lying down exercise. That's exactly what you do. Alejandra, you had something to say. Uh, yeah, just a comment. I, after all that, I feel my arm um, softer and, yes, smoother and in, a, in an easier condition to move it anywhere it yeah. feels really uh, very well and um 
yeah in fact more in control to, more in to control. play and i think i just quit my end gaining intention to play to play and let it be more fantastic thank you i'm glad it was yeah. so helpful <laughs> So this is why I like to make I I liked I did decide to make this one the introduction and for people to come back to it when they've completed each section and to always have that in the background somewhere when you see your pupil could use a little of that you know just have them do it for a minute or two yeah um, look uh, several of you are new. And uh, I'm really glad that you're here and partaking. If some of you have turned your cameras off, but we're what we're going to do now, the structure of an, this online institute once a week is that we have the awareness through piano movement lesson, and then we have individual lessons. So you're, when you pay your fee, you just pay 25 bucks, and that's for the for what we just did. But you're, everybody's welcome to stay now for the lessons which are going to follow. And, uh, and if, you know, if you have sort of a question, but you're not quite ready to formulate it yet or whatever, just, you know, I'm, we're going to have a little discussion after each lesson now. And if you have anything that relates to what we just did or what you saw in the lesson, please feel free to, to join in. So let's take a break for just a couple of minutes, a water in, water out break, and, but, and then we'll start with our individual sessions. Um, Alan, you'll have a tape of this? Uh, yeah, this recording. is being recorded. It's being I, recorded I twice. It's being recorded by me in gallery view and by Hanno in speaker view. Oh, and I forgot, for the lessons, let me do that right now before I forget. I'm going to stop this recording.